Hi, I'm Jason Wachab, founder and CEO of My Buddy Green, the best-selling author of Wealth, and your host for the My Buddy Green podcast, where I'll be bringing you deep and insightful dialogues with some of the greatest minds in wellness. If you like what you hear, please give us a five-star review, comment, and share with your friends and family. And don't forget to visit us at mybuddygreen.com for your daily dose of wellness. In today's age of massive grocery stores and fast food on every corner, it can be difficult to feel connected to the food on your plate. Thrive Market is on a mission to change that. The online marketplace is making healthy living easy and affordable for everyone by stocking a highly curated catalog of thousands of food and household items for less. And right now, they're offering an amazing deal to new users. Get $60 of free organic groceries plus free shipping. Go to thrivemarket.com slash mindbuddygreen now and you'll notice that more than 70% of their catalog cannot be found on stores like Amazon. Let's break down how it works. Thrive does the heavy lifting for you and allows you to filter based on the values that you care about. Click through 90 categories like organic, non-GMO, and BPA-free to find out your favorite foods and natural products, all at prices up to 50% less than those you'll find in the grocery store. They offer the same savings on non-food items too. I'm talking eco-friendly cleaning supplies, non-toxic beauty products, kitchen staples, and home goods. Visit thrivemarket.com slash mindbuddygreen to unlock $60 of free organic groceries plus free shipping. That's right, $60 in free organic curated groceries. Again, that's thrivemarket.com slash mindbuddygreen. Once you start using Thrive Market, you'll wonder what you ever did without it. Hi, I'm Colleen Wachup, co-founder and chief brand officer at MindBodyGreen. I know that leggings are so much more than workout clothes. I wear them to yoga, of course, but I wear them just about everywhere else, too. Fabletics, co-founded by Kate Hudson, is premium activewear at a great value. You get performance, quality, and style for two to three times less than other activewear brands. Fabletics leggings are made for every body. No one is left out here with sizes from extra extra small to 3X in petite, regular, and tall lengths. Whatever your lifestyle, Fabletics fits you. When you visit the site for the first time, you're given a style quiz. Then Fabletics personalizes your shopping experience so your favorite styles rise to the top. You can shop as a guest or become a VIP. Spoiler, becoming a VIP is by far the best way to shop. VIPs save 40 to 50% off retail prices and gain access to tons of other exclusive sales and perks. I signed up as a VIP and it's awesome. I found a pair with mesh panels that kept me cool during heated yoga flows and a floral pattern pair so cute I'm wearing them all spring instead of my sundresses. Every month, Fabletics releases new looks so you're always in style. And when you're a VIP, the experience is even cooler. You'll get a serious discount on all the workout wear you could ever want. Go to fabletics.com slash mbg now to get two pairs of their amazing leggings for just $24. Seriously, these are great leggings. They're a $99 value and you'll get two for only $24 when you join at fabletics.com slash mbg. That's fabletics.com slash mbg. Hey, everybody. I just want to take a quick moment to thank you all for listening to the podcast and to say that we want to listen to you. So if you have any questions, any dream guests, we are all ears. I would love to hear from you. So ask me anything and stay tuned for the answers or your dream guests on this very podcast. Send your questions to podcast at mindbodygreen.com. That's podcastgreen.com. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thanks so much. And let's go back to the podcast. Sarah Wilson is the journalist, entrepreneur, and author behind the I Quit Sugar empire that has helped people around the world give up the sweet stuff for the sake of their health. I've known Sarah since she first launched I Quit Sugar and have watched over the years as she has transitioned to talk more about her struggle with an illness that we're not talking about nearly enough, anxiety. Her new book, First We Make the Beast Beautiful, dives into how Sarah has coped with her lifelong anxiety, and it's a must-have handbook, rich with information on everything from how to talk your way down from a panic attack to how to help a friend or loved one through their anxious moments. Without further ado, here's Sarah. Sarah, welcome. Thank you, Jason. It's great to, great to see you again, although I think last time I saw you, I spilt... 
I think it was actually kombucha before it was really fashionable. I think I spilled a glass of kombucha on you. I, um, I, that is correct. I think it was like <laughs> four or five years ago at Who Kitchen yeah. when it like first opened. We met there. Yeah, and, and you spilled. The, I think the stain got out. It's all good. Yeah, we're, we've, you've you've had me back. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an honor to have you back, and congratulations on the new book, which everyone has to pick up first. We make the beast beautiful, but but we're going to come back to the book and the mm-hmm. journey of the book. So let's go to the journey, and it started at Cosmo. Yeah, I guess you could say you, all great things start at Cosmo, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I've been a journalist for 20 years, and um, which gives an indication of just how old I am. Um, the day and age, that can mean you're like 25. Mm-hmm, yeah. With the yeah. Internet. <laughs> Double that, almost. <laughs> um, so I had been a journalist at 29. I became the editor of, of Cosmopolitan, and... Um, that was quite a journey. I'd never even read the magazine in my life and I'd never worn anything but flat shoes. And so it was quite an eye opener. Um, I'd been writing a, a political column and sort of a social commentary column in one of the Ru- Mur- Rupert Murdoch um, papers. And for whatever reason, I was noticed. They thought I'd make a great editor and I was thrown in the deep end So and, and swam and, and loved it. Um, did four years there. And then I, I got very unwell and I think we've talked about it before mm. um, and I've written about it on your site. Um, I developed Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease of the thyroid gland and got really, really sick. So totally went to ground. I couldn't walk. I couldn't work for about nine, ten months. And during that time, funnily enough, I got picked up to go and be the host of MasterChef Australia, which <laughs> went on to become the most watched show in Australian mm. history. Um God knows how that happened, but it did. Uh, I don't remember much of it because I was so unwell and it was the worst time in my life and there I was on on national television. Um, But, you know, all part of the the journey, as you say. Eventually, I I got so bad I had to do something. So I extracted myself and took a suitcase of belongings and moved to an army hut in the forest in in Byron Bay, just outside Byron Bay. And some of your listeners might know about it because it's like... It's the wellness capital of Australia. That's (laughs) it. That's it. I kind of think it's a bit like Santa Cruz, you know, Santa Cruz in Australia. But I went and lived up there for a year and a half and I started experimenting with... Kind of different ways to get well and this was really pre the whole uh wellness revolution where every you know nobody had heard of kale put it that way <laughs> um chia seeds were you know confined to bolivia back then <laughs> so i sort of went up there and um i was writing a column it was sort of killing two birds with one stone i i didn't have much energy so i wrote this column for one of the magazines investigated a way to get well and it was also a way of me being able to experiment with wellness techniques while getting paid for it it was a genius solution to my predicament. And one of the experiments I did, of course, was quitting sugar. And so my column each week went, this week I dot, 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 and it was this week I quit sugar. So that became the title of a blog post and then a series of blog posts then an ebook, which became an Amazon bestseller. And then a publisher said, can we print it as a print book? So as with many things in my life, I've done it back to front. You know, it was quite unusual back then to go from an ebook to a print sure. book. I think it's sort of more common these days. And in fact, I think that's when we met was it became a New York Times bestseller. It became an empire. (laughs) Yeah. And it just kind of kept growing and growing. And I just had more and more to learn and science was sort of really starting to speed up in this area. When I first emerged with all of this information, people thought I was mad. You know, they were saying things like, you know, you're cutting out a whole food group. And you've heard that language before, I'm sure. And I'm like, since when was sugar a food group, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, and it just kept growing. And, and I reached a point, you know, just recently where I had 20 staff, uh, supermarket products, you know, I make my own range of pasta raised gelatin, you know, r- random, I know, um, <laughs> and 15 ebooks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think, as, as you know, and I just recently shut all of that down. So, wow. yeah, that's I've, the journey well, has, I've, that journey uh, just ended recently. Well, yeah. I have a couple of questions about that journey. So, one, like, obviously, you, you learned that sugar was, was not very good, and, mm-hmm. and specifically not very good for you. So, I want to hear a little bit more about you know, how you change your diet and and learning to live with autoimmune in a way where you had energy and could thrive. So talk about like what you learned about nutrition and, mm. and, and what that looks like, what your diet looks like today. Yeah. Leading up to, I want to talk about like the decision to walk away. Okay. So, 
The the thing about sugar is I was really addicted and I was one of those kind of seductive addicted sugar you know sort of eaters where I was eating dark chocolate and I was having honey on my granola and with dates and bananas and I didn't realize that that was all adding up to a lot of fructose. So when you say I quit sugar, it's it's really I quit fructose, but really that doesn't mean much to people. And most people consume fructose as table sugar or sugar mm-hmm. in their soft drink or their, their fizzy drink. So most of your listeners would know this, but sucrose or everyday table sugar is half fructose and half glucose. Glucose is fine. It's in most food and we metabolize it really well and we need it for energy. Fructose, however, is metabolized in our, our system much like we process alcohol or other toxins. And that is, it's, it's not kind of uh, processed through our cells and used as energy. It's mostly processed in our liver. And our liver is there to protect us from poison and, and it, it deems fructose a poison. So it, it processes it through the liver. And if it can't do it fast enough, it's like for instance, when we drink a can of Coke, mm-hmm. that's a hell of a lot of a dumping of sugar, fast and furious because it's liquid, onto the liver, nine teaspoons, bam, it stores that uh, sugar as visceral fat, which we know is the worst fat. That whole kind of situation also leads to incredible inflammation in the body. And we know now, and we didn't back then, it was really just a nascent science, but um, I was starting to learn about all of this stuff just by reading. I just went down deeper and deeper and deeper. And these were all sort of uh, new studies at the time. They've now been published and we now treat it almost as gold standard science. But inflammation really is, I guess, the prime problem with with the met- metabolic diseases that we face today. And for me, with thyroid disease and autoimmune disease, it was triggering my, my disease, like every mouthful of sugar I was having, it was getting worse because of the sugar, because of the inflammation. Mm-hmm. So it was sort of all of that information um, that led me to confront my gnarly sugar addiction. And I went cold turkey and I'd researched that that was the only way to go about it. So the great thing about quitting sugar is in two weeks, within two weeks, you do notice a difference. Mm. So it's not like other diets where you get, you know, nothing happens, right. you know, and it's kind of deflating, um, you start to notice your skin change. So collagen and the elastin in your skin um, is affected hugely by sugar consumption. In fact, they say it has more, does more damage than sun to your skin. Mm. I suddenly noticed that my pimples and wrinkles were backing off, you know, and that was enough, you know, that sort of vanity kick, you know, sure. kept me going. So I kept going and within about six weeks, I'd gone through the worst of the detox, which was pretty gnarly at the time. And I very much noticed that my energy was better. The inflammation was better. I had horrible aches and pains all through my body, stomach issues, the whole thing. And just it all started to unpack. It all started to kind of unravel. And I kept going simply because it was working and I just felt good. And every time I went and ate sugar, I felt worse again. And, you know, to answer your question today, I I ate sugar and, and – but not a lot of it. I know how much my body can handle. And the science shows that it's about six teaspoons for women, about nine for men. I mostly uh, get my sugar from chocolate. Um, I love dark chocolate. It does great things for me. It makes me happy. And so, yeah, I choose it to to eat it sort of via fruit and dark chocolate. That's sort of, that's how I I choose to eat it. So how would you describe your food philosophy today? It's it's that whole kind of just eat real food thing, yeah, you know, like the jerf. Yeah, it's just um, the great thing about quitting sugar, and I'd say this is the most powerful part of it, and I'm, I'm not fanatical. I really don't like the idea of, and I've never been fanatical about the way I do things. So we used to allow a glass of red wine each night sure. on the program, that kind of thing, because I think you've got to have some looseness around yeah. the edges, you know, to get the desired result. But, yeah, my diet today – oh, sorry, I should finish that – when you quit sugar, you're essentially quitting processed food because anything that's processed has added sugar. Right. So you're also cutting out all the other crap, right? You know, the, the chemicals, the, the horrible, you know, fats and oils, all the additives. So I would say my diet is predominantly unprocessed, you know, and this is what I say. When you quit sugar, you have to quit processed food, which means you've got to learn to cook. <laughs> and so, you know, when people say, what's your number one secret for good health? And I'm like... I cook my own food. Right. So my answer to you there is that's my diet. My diet today, my diet philosophy is I cook. Do you take any supplements? Yeah, I do. I take supplements um, primarily to kind of 
uh, deal with my anxiety, sure. which we'll get to in a moment, I'm sure. But um, so I take magnesium, sure. um, magnesium what? citrate yep. at night. Um, I find that the best form of magnesium. It, yep. it, it ticks off a number of boxes that I have to deal with. In Do you ever some get year. really lucid dreams? No. Because that, that's the thing with magnesium sometimes. Yeah. You know that? yeah. I don't. I, I, and if I do, I enjoy them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it really helps me sleep. So I take that. I take zinc. Yep. You, I'm, I'm speaking to a wonderfully engaged health audience here, but the MTHFR gene, which sure, I, I think everyone's, too. you yeah. have it too, a yeah. derangement. Yeah. So I take vitamin supplements to help with that. Yep. And it's made a massive, massive difference to both my autoimmune disease, um, my insomnia and my anxiety. So Did you have like high homocysteine or? Oh, you know what? I can't You're bloody now. remember. Right. I think I also, yeah, when, when I got to that point, it was kind of a, it was only very recently that I realized that that was... And I've got to say, I've got a bit of health wash. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I'm sort of now keeping things as simple as I can. And that's kind of my life philosophy sure. at the moment. So, you know, I, I look into things and then I find what I think will work. And I stick to that until it doesn't work anymore. And then I go and investigate the, the next sure. thing. I, I keep alive to it all. Yeah. I love that. I have very similar philosophy. I know and, you and do. And nothing works forever either. It's like no. what works for you now may not work for you yeah. in five years and see You've how you feel. Dance. And, and yeah. Mm. So, you know, you mentioned anxiety. And so you're, you're, you go through this amazing journey, uh, crippling autoimmune to healing yourself to building a really amazing, credible, inspirational, personal brand around in wellness, around wellness, mm. you know, building an empire and you're very, very public personality and traveling the world. But people probably don't realize there's anxiety in a big way happening and talk, mm. talk to us about what that was like, where part of you was becoming this yeah. huge personal brand within wellness and also dealing with anxiety and leading to the, the book today. Yeah, um, I've had anxiety for as long as I can remember and before I knew it was anxiety and before anyone really knew what anxiety was. I was a very complicated, intense child and um, was an insomniac from a very young age. And, you know, over the years, I'll you know, do the tick list. I had childhood anxiety, whatever that was back in the, the 80s. Um, so what does that look like for a kid? Like what's the picture of that? Well, it, I had an obsessive compulsive disorder at that yeah. age. That wasn't diagnosed until later, but I had a whole heap of nighttime rituals and things I had to do. I had to, to do, and it was always to counting sets of three and four. I was bullied um, for my intensity. I was very, very intense. Um, I had to ask a lot of questions all the time, and you know. I was just startled in a, in, a, in a permanent state of being startled and I did not get it. You know, I, I just felt very much an outsider. I explored religion from a very young age, so I used to read the Bible mm -hmm. <laughs> line by line trying to find an answer. That was my only outlet. I had a business at the age of 12, which went on actually to fund some of my family's Christmases. Oh I bought God. the first what family TV. What was the business? Um, it was, it was, I had a great name actually. I don't know where I got this stuff from, but it was called Creation Engine. And the word Creation Engine, because I developed a stamp, um, came out of the, the steam of a steam engine, right? <laughs> I know. I, I was a, a young copy, a budding copywriter. And I made doll's house furniture and I made made sort of like library bags. You know how we sure. all grew up with yeah, a, yeah. a tote bag that we take for library bags? All these day? things are like coming back. Yeah, yeah. You were very early on the trend. That's trends. right, that's right. And I painted them with, you know, sort of graphics that appealed to... Ironically, it was so funny. I used to sell these bags in the rich people's kind of toy shop and galleries in, in Canberra, which is Australia's capital city. And I lived in the country and mum would go into town once a fortnight to pick up supplies. And I'd go and, to these rich shops and I'd just go around and distribute my wares. And it was so funny because I'd be in there as a 12-year-old and I'd watch mothers with their like 14-year-old daughters buy my stuff, which I found, you know. I love it. Yeah, really funny. So that was my business. And that, I suppose, was derived from my anxiety because I was really fundamentally bored. So I would create things to do. And that also coincided with my obsession with religion. So 
mum and dad would come go into church and I would try to go to different churches. So oh, the Scientologists got hold of me at some point, the Hare Krishnas. I would go from one thing to the next. How long did you last in those? Uh... <laughs> if you I am. But I would be in tears afterwards because I still hadn't found the answer. And I, and I share this in the book that I think the spiritual search can coincide with the, the sort of the onset of anxiety. The two have always been interconnected. You know, the most tortured souls went on to write, you know, the most wonderfully rich spiritual books throughout history. The two are very much connected. And actually, I got asked yesterday you know, on, a, on a commercial television show whether I believed in God. Yeah. You know. Do you? Do you believe in God? Uh, my answer then and, and strangely one day later is the same. It's... um. I believe in a force that is grand. It's bigger than us. And I call it life. I call it sort of, uh, and, and it's got a flow and mm -hmm. it's got a certain set of patterns that when you start to work it out, you can work with it and you can respect it and revere it. And the notion of sacrifice, mm -hmm. um, or I prefer to call it surrendering preferences, Right. those kinds of things I feel make a lot of intuitive sense of deep and I would call myself spiritual I suppose because sure. so. I would I would think that having a belief in something much bigger than yourself is helpful for anxiety and just it, mm. just being in you know having situations in my life where not anxiety per se but situations were just terrible awful there is no you know right way to turn or there's yes. nothing out there it's this idea of What's like capitulation where it's like i give up you know it's like this, this what people will talk about like spiritually it's like they drop they drop on their knees and pray because there's nothing there and i think from what i know about anxiety there are moments when it's like you just it's an ex existential it, yeah, angst it, it, there is and like mm. the closest thing for me that i can relate to you know like i am like claustrophobic yeah like so like I've never been trapped in an elevator, but like I could imagine that would not be a good situation for me. <laughs> and so I equate where it's like there's nothing there where it's like you just help me. Like I yeah, can't, I, can't, cry, I can't do it. You cry out to right. something, right? And right. Yeah. I mean, I start the book off with a discussion of this nebulous idea and I call it the something else capital S, capital E. And I talk about this um, sense that we we feel there's something there, there's a point, there's a, an experience. And, you know, I think sometimes in meditation, we can touch that thing, you know, we, we, we get that experience of oneness, of mm -hmm. being in flow with life. And, you know, I say in the book, once you've experienced it, once you've experienced it, you can't unsee it. Right. And you want to go back for more. And, and that's, got a lot of spiritual kind of overtones, sure. right? And the something else is is this sense that we are here for something beyond going to the mall and eating brunch on Saturday with friends. Like, really? It's there more, has it's to more be. more than unicorn lattes and avocado toast. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, God, isn't it funny how these trends transcend, you know, all the way across to Australia and back again to the US? Because um, we've got exactly that kind of thing and I've got the same kind of attitude too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we are all seeking it. You know, I referred to Edward Munch's The Scream, you know, that famous portrait. And that was his representation of of just anxiety and existential desire to know what on earth we're here for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's this primordial kind of crying out to the gods to say, what is this about? And really, when you're not anxious and when you're getting on with your life, you can kind of, it's like, I, you know, it's like having sound cancelling earphones on, right? Mm -hmm. But when we hit a hard, tense, hypersensitive personality, which is essentially what anxious people are, sure. You're attuned to it. You're alive to that big question. And that's, I guess, very spiritual, I suppose. It, 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 it overlaps. So being embedded in wellness, what were some of the tools that really helped with anxiety? Like what, what worked? Hmm. I'm curious what didn't work. Yeah. And advice yeah. for people out there maybe listening. Who... Well, as an overarching background kind of theory to this answer, 
what we have grown up with is this idea, especially, you know, the self-help revolution. We are products of the self-help revolution, you and I, Jason. Like, we're that age group, right? You know? Sure. And I think that we have grown up believing that there's a fix out there, but we've got to go out there to find it. So there's a guru or there's a mm-hmm. book that's got the answers. In some cases, it might be um, a new lipstick, a new boyfriend, a new job, a new holiday, but it's always out there. Or an affirmation. Or an affirmation or a hashtag, right? What do you say? Yeah. Um, so we're always reaching outwards. And, you know, the spiritualists and the philosophers over the years from the Greeks onwards have talked about the journey back towards yourself. And I believe that the most effective techniques for managing wellness and anxiety, because it's all kind of the same thing, sure. is stuff that, send, that brings you closer to yourself and doesn't drag you out looking, grasping at at other people's ideas, essentially. Mm -hmm. So some of the stuff I think that works, and of course, I'm always going to sound like a self-help guru when I'm giving advice like this, but it's based on extensive interviews with incredible people. It took me seven years to research this book, and I traveled the world with one suitcase. So after I went to that hut in the forest, I didn't accumulate any more stuff. And I stuck with that one suitcase, and I've been traveling for eight years with that. And I've only just kind of settled um, it's been hard. It's been my latest experiment to see if I can stay in one place a- and buy a fridge. Um, <laughs> uh. Mind you, it's secondhand. But, yeah, so the techniques that I think that work are things that bring us back into ourselves and they're often like they're really super simple and they're kind of age-old techniques. So, so one that really does work is walking. Now, that sounds really kind of boring, except that the science that backs it up is super interesting. So... What we find is that the pace of walking goes at the same pace as discerning thought. Hmm. So that's why you hear about people here in New York, for instance, who do walking meetings Mm -hmm. because you actually think better. I think a lot of anxiety today exists because we go at a pace that's not conducive to discerning thought. So our thoughts all build up and up and up and we've got no ability to to piece them apart and work out what we feel. Um, It's just information overload. So walking gets us at exactly the right pace to think well, you know. Mm. That's one thing. Is all, quick question on walking, is is all Mm. walking created equal? Yeah. Like is walking nature better than city or walking fast versus slow or steps, not steps? (laughs) Uh, Walking in nature amps it up twofold and the science shows it as such. And the Japanese are obsessed by this. Um, I think there's a new book about it actually out at the moment called Forest Bathing. That's their term. Yeah. 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 And they've got a lot of studies that that show that nature, trees and plants emit these aerosols that can calm our minds that have a huge impact on, you know, sort of the human biology. So that's one, that's, to answer your question, absolutely. Being in, being in um, nature, also being in expansive places that bring on a state of awe. So what they've found is the oxytocin levels in our, in our being increase when we are in expansive places where we go, oh my God, check out that view. Brooklyn Bridge here in our park. Well, something like that. <laughs> I'm, th- I'm thinking more of Big Canyon, but, you okay. know, we'll, we'll work with All the bridge. Right. We'll start where we are. Um, so, yes, I find that really interesting. I actually think, you know, that kind of ox- – the oxytocin is the love connection hormone. Mm-hmm. And I often find myself, like, if I'm at a, a sunset – you know, I think it's why we all take photos, right? And sure. want to share it on Instagram because it's like, hey, everybody, I want to connect, check this shit out, you know? Yep. So, yes, but look, any kind of walking, and I advocate just putting on your shoes because when you're anxious, the idea of having to go out and find some incredible perfect park with the best sunset ever with beautiful trees is a bridge too far, right? Keep it simple. Tie on your shoes, just walk out the house for 20 mm. minutes, just walk. And you will improve instantly. So the other kind of bit of science behind that is, and I find this fascinating and very empowering, anxiety, the the part of the brain that controls anxiety is one of the oldest, gnarliest kind of primitive parts of our brain. It was one of the first bits that kind of emerged from our tadpole beginnings, you know. And it's also the part of the brain that controls um, decision-making, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, So the two are intertwined, which is why... Trying to make decisions when you're anxious is almost impossible and why making too many decisions will make us anxious. But 
to get back to the walking thing, the anxious part of our brain is really, really simple. It's actually a monotasker. So if it can only focus on one thing at a time and walking apparently shuts down the the anxious mechanism. Mm. So while we're walking, our anxious part of our brain just goes, oh, can't do two things at once. We might just, you know, stop for a bit. So it's actually like it's kind of a no-brainer technique, just walk. So that's one of the things. And going back to what I just mentioned before about decision-making. So you've probably come across all these big thought leaders who have morning routines, you know, and wear one outfit and have boring breakfasts, you know. Decision fatigue. Exactly, right? So decision fatigue is one thing. That's one reason why you kind of have these routines so that you don't have to make decisions in the morning and you don't overuse that muscle. But it's also to reduce anxiety because it's the same part of the brain. Mm. If you overwork that decision-making muscle, it will trigger anxiety. So... A morning routine is another thing that that absolutely works. The sugar um, part of things, anything that can reduce inflammation. So back when I first started the sugar journey, for instance, and in fact this journey to write the book, we were talking still in terms of um, anxiety being a chemical imbalance in the brain. And that's how we medicated, all of that kind of stuff. Since then, really in the last three to four years, that's been found to be faulty science. It actually doesn't have a strong basis, what they're finding instead is that it's mostly about gut health, which you know all about, right? And your listeners do it. The microbiome. And so sugar, of course, wreaks havoc with that. It totally stuffs with your your gut balance, you know, with the right prebiotics, probiotics, all of that kind of thing. On top of that, the inflammation. And they essentially say, you know, is it fire in the gut is fire in the brain. Mm -hmm. If you are inflaming your gut, it travels all the way up and, of course, is inflaming your brain. And they're now finding that that really is the core issue with anxiety. And, in fact, they've, they've done studies with taking sugar out of the diet of people with bipolar and it's had incredible results. Like there's actually been some close to gold standard science that's shown wow. that. Yeah. So would you say do you suffer from anxiety today? Oh, yeah. It's my constant companion. I don't expect to rid myself of it and... You know, to repeat what I said before, we are a generation that think we can fix everything, that there's a fix out there. And I've experienced the most amount of peace when I gave up on that idea and instead decided that I can be anxious and I can have an amazing life. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. I don't have to get rid of the anxiety first to have a meaningful life, you know. Mm. And when I realised that, it was a game changer. So in some ways, I allow myself to be anxious. I give myself, you know, permission, sure. <laughs> which, you know, affirm- hashtag affirmation. But what that does, it's a really simple process, again, backed by science. Anxiety is often a really big problem because we get anxious about being anxious, right? Because we think we shouldn't be this anxious. Oh, we should be able to cope. We should be able to work this out. There'll be a fix out there. Then we get anxious about being anxious about being anxious and so on it goes. And that's probably the most dangerous part about anxiety. And I've just worked out if I just do anxiety once, all right, I'm anxious, right? I don't make it worse by feeling I should be any other way. So that's been a really big thing for me. So look, to be totally honest, I arrived here a couple of nights ago and the trip from Australia is not pleasant. You know, it's long and it's hard and it's ugly. And How many hours is that? (laughs) Oh, this one was close to 40 hours in the end. It should really only have been 21, 22, but there were delays at LA airport. There were delays everywhere. And by the end of it, you are a shell of a human, you know, (sighs) like it hurts. Um, So I arrived, I hadn't slept before I got on the plane, like I hadn't slept that night. I just had lots of stuff going on. And then I didn't sleep on the plane. I slept a couple of dozy hours and then I arrived and I didn't sleep when I arrived. So it was sort of a good three and a half days without sleep and, you know, I freaked out. I went down into the dark place where I couldn't find an out. You know, you described your claustrophobia before where you Mm -hmm. go, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, and that's where I was at. I was um, lying on the bathroom floor in a hotel in Midtown and I, um, I, I actually couldn't think of a way out. And, you know, I, I still get to that place and, 
The difference is I accept it and I don't think to myself that I'm a failure because of it. I can now see the beauty in it. And I look, Steve Jobs at a commencement address he did some time back, he talked about the idea of at this age, whatever age he was, you know, in his 40s or 50s, I think, he, 50s perhaps. Yeah. He said, I can turn around and I can look at all the things in my life that caused great distress. And of course, he had terrible anxiety. And he said, but I can see that the dots all joined together. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm at an age now, and sometimes I say this to young people, sometimes the only fix is sheer years on the planet. You know, Mm. I can look back and I can see, oh my God, that moment that was just so distressing led to that. And it wouldn't have happened otherwise. And then it led to that. And I can see that it all made sense. And I say this to young people, teenagers often come to the talks I do and I can see their anguish. They're just like swirling around going, what the hell is this about? You know, they're generally wonderful humans with big futures ahead of them. You can just tell by the look in their eyes. And I say, I say to them, do you feel that this is a sickness or do you feel that there is something there that makes sense? There's something in this. And they go, no, there's something in this. And I said, all right, hold on to that. Hold on to it and it will make sense. And... That's what I try to remind myself of when I'm going through those moments. And you know what? I emerged the next day. I had to go and do, t- you know, an hour or it turned out to be two and a half hours of filming, of television. Um, I made it, you know, and I did both. I freaked out. I had not had this incredible right. experience. So when you're in a low, when you're like in the bathtub in a hotel and you're freaking out, is the moment, do, do you think to yourself like, I just need to ride this out. I've seen this happen before. Like, I just need, this sucks. I'm aware. It's like, or, or I don't know. It's not quite as calm as that. No, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, or, or is it like, I don't know if I'm ever going to get out of like, what is that like? I just want people to know what that's like, um, how hard it is. I'll be absolutely honest. Um, It's not uncommon for me to feel the only way out is to die in those moments. And I've been there I've been there many times, um, but I now know what it is. I now know that it's a process and it's part of my life experience is to get to that desperate, desperate space. Look, all I can say is I passed through it and I've passed through it enough times to know I will get through it. It's, It's no more comfortable. It's no less painful. However, there's sort of a meta, broader sense of purpose that sort of sits somewhere in the background where I kind of, I'm able to have that conversation with myself. I'm able to get just enough distance from the anxiety because, of course, you think you are the anxiety. You Mm -hmm. think it is everything and you totally sink into it. But I know how to have the conversation where I go, okay, that's my anxiety I am freaking out. This is hell. Sure. And I don't know what's going to happen. Having that conversation is enough to distance me from from it. And I just get these wafts of perspective. Mm -hmm. And I had a I describe it sort of halfway through the book. I hope it doesn't ruin it for people if they get around to buying the book. Everyone's going to buy the book. The book's amazing. (laughs) It's one of the. It's like probably the best book written about this. Thank you. Beautiful cover too. It's like one of the books like you don't like nothing against Kindles. I love the Kindle, but like you want to like it's just beautiful. It's um you know that French word truc. It means a special thing, a little thing. That's what I wanted it to feel like. And I spent two years going around bookstores around the world and touching the covers. So I want it to have a moleskin feel. And you might notice it's got quite wide columns. And you'll notice that I've put notes in the columns um, in the book. And I invite people to write their own notes. And so people have done that. They write their own notes. You can sort of see I've written my little, you know, afterthoughts or something my editor said to me as, you know, they were working through the book or whatever. Um, So I wanted it to have that diary journal type feel so that people went through it themselves you know as they read the book but back to what was i talking about you were talking about about getting through what that's like and 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 the low point and oh yeah 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 look i think i think just the fact that i wrote that book it's the best thing i've ever done because it has actually got me very alive to a sense of duty I say this in the book, there's a book, oh, that's right, this is what I was going to say. Um, Halfway through the book, I describe a moment, a turning point, and it was in a, 
th- again, it was three days with no sleep and I was ready to die. It was a, it was very much a suicidal moment in my life. And I looked in a mirror and I didn't recognize myself. I could not see myself. It mm. was a different person. And I'd gone down so low and I felt that there was no way out. I'd explored every option in my head and it was like a clusterfuck of competing thoughts that had just kind of matted into a ball of wool in my head. And I was ready to go. Then this kind of waft of a thought came over me and I went, oh, hang on. All right, well, if that's, if that's where I'm going to head, hang on, I could actually do this differently. What if completely differently? And I just went out there with the clothes on my back, gave up on absolutely everything that had defined me and started again Mm. and that's essentially what I did that was kind of if I was to have a turning point it was then and that was in my mid-30s and that's when I packed everything up and moved to Byron and lived in a hut in the forest and since then I remind myself of that I'm doing life differently I am I I won't go on the conveyor belt I won't play by the rules I'll live according to what I feel is right and let's see what happens and That in itself, that kind of call to arms, that sense of responsibility to do that, that's kind of my, what do they call it in self, the North Star? Sure. You know, that's what kind of keeps me going. And I describe it as having, when you have a mental illness, to use, you know, that term that I don't always like to use, but hey, that's what we're lumped with. Sure. It's like carrying around a shallow bowl of water for the rest of your life and it forces you to walk steadily and so it forces because otherwise you'll slosh the water and start to get unstable and that water will slosh all over everyone and then you'll have to go back to the source over and over again to fill yourself back up again. Mm. If you can walk steadily, it's actually quite a wonderful thing to be rendered choiceless in that way. I have to make sure I get to bed at a reasonable time. I have to enforce boundaries on my life. I have to eat well. You know, it's kind of non-negotiable. I have to meditate. And then I also have to choose certain ways of living that are about freedom and being real because anything else is intolerable for me and will see me slosh that. that. So in some ways, that's where the title comes from. First, we make the beast beautiful. You know, the the beast has become beautiful for me. It is the thing that makes my life amazing you know, because I'm rendered choiceless. But ironically, from making that choice to live my life this way and and live it for real, you know? Mm-hmm. So you mentioned the word conversation and having the conversation with yourself. There, there are people listening who I'm sure have loved ones who struggle with anxiety, depression, and they want to have a conversation. And, and some people yeah. will you know, say the wrong thing, they'll, they'll say, some people will say like, Oh, like snap out of it or do this or that, like out of Mm. frustration, they don't, they don't understand it, calm down. And then other people. So what do you say to someone who's struggling? And then some people like who, you know, and I've lost friends to suicide and, and, Mm. um, you know, some people always bring up the word, oh, it's selfish, the left people behind. And from, it's just, it's not like, it's not no. so simple. And, no, it's not at all. And what do you say? What do you say to someone, I guess, if someone's listening, first, sorry, first question. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's a few there. What do you, yeah, what, what do you say to someone who wants to help, help someone? Yeah. It's not like, take a deep breath or mm. maybe meditate I more. Think I, or, I, or, <laughs> I wrote this on Instagram once. I went, never in the history of people telling people to calm down has anyone been able to calm down you know (laughs) um no look i have found that one of the most wonderful things about writing this book is the number of people who don't have anxiety who've chosen to read it to understand a loved one like that to me is you know brings me to tears when when it happens because god that's incredibly generous you know why would you want to read this big thick book with an octopus on the cover so pretty well, it's pretty. It's true. <laughs> I lure people in and, and there's silver foil and, and fluoro orange bubbles. So, um, but yes, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like quite... a giant cartoon. <laughs> yeah, there's pictures. Yeah. Um, so I think there's two bits of advice that I give in the book and um, I've realized they've become two of the book for people um, because it's actually helped them connect, you know, both – uh, non-anxious with the anxious and the anxious with the non-anxious. It's you know it's been actually really lovely. So there's two things. Um, first of all, I mentioned all that stuff about not being able to make decisions. So what often people do is when they confront an anxious person, they'll go, 
is there anything I can do for you? Or, oh, look, would you like to eat something? Or, what, you know, what do, what do you want to do? Do you want to go to the movies? You know? And you can totally understand why people do that. You know, here's this kind of generally control freaky A type personality most of the time who's suddenly having a breakdown. Most people are too scared to go near them to, to sort of, you know, so it's like, what would you like to do? That is probably one of the worst things you can do. So if you're a loved one, can I strongly, you know, who've, who knows somebody who's anxious, can I strongly advise that you make decisions for them when they're in that moment of, of panic or anxiety? I remember my friend Rick, he, he knew I was in a bad place. I was having a dreadful moment and he rang me and he said, right, sweetheart, we're meeting at six o'clock at the traffic lights. We're going to go and see a movie at 6.15. We've chosen the movie, we've booked the tickets and then we're going to go and have Indian takeaway afterwards. <laughs> and I just went, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's no choice in the matter. I had to be there. The tickets were bought. Somebody had made the decision. It was actually a relief to go, oh, well, it might not have been my choice, but I have to go. You know, here's this moment of generosity. So um, make decisions for people when they're in a tough spot. That will help them. They'll be able to get to the next step and they'll be fine. The other thing that I say is that quite often when um, the anxious are having a freak out, we look like we're trying to control the people around us, you know, and I think husbands and wives really suffer from Mm -hmm. this. And so it causes a lot of friction. And I think one helpful thing is to understand that when we're anxious, we're not trying to control other people. We're trying to control circumstances or triggers that will send us into a spiral. So if we're on the edge, we're going to try to just make sure that there's certain things that aren't going to send us over the edge so that we don't ruin the night on the couch with you watching Netflix or ruin the dinner party that you've so generously organised for us. And when I tell people that, they go, oh, that makes so much sense. You're not trying to control us. You're trying to control circumstances so that you don't ruin your time with us. Those two techniques, I think, have proven really helpful. I've been able to tell people around me that stuff and, and they really try to practice it and so it's made a big thing, difference. the last thing you should do is say, what can I do to help? It's say, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Exactly, exactly. And then there is a connection, and you alluded to this, sleep and anxiety. Mm. What do you say to someone who, you know, you, you know, you know, loved one they're starting not to sleep and you see how this movie is played before Mm -hmm. what can you do to help somebody in that situation um look i have a whole chapter on it um and in fact i revisit it several times because it's a huge trigger for me most people like most people yeah yeah most people and it's kind of the ultimate irony the anxious especially because if we've got inflammation which we often do we need sleep more than anyone else Mm -hmm. um and yet we're the ones that often can't get the sleep um look there's a couple of different theories that i explore in the book and i can't say i have an answer i don't think anyone has an answer otherwise they'd be a very rich person right now (laughs) with some magic pill or something I do a again it's a, you know the dance you know sure. I play around with the magnesium yep. um, citrate really does help I take a valerian complex tablet which helps yep. me and then I also have valium nearby sure. for for special occasions <laughs> sure. when it's just too bad sometimes it works sometimes I have to go there yeah. and as John Lennon said whatever gets you through the night and sometimes <laughs> that's what it comes down to but it's really about sort of dieta energy, you know, in Ayurvedic sure. terms throughout your day. I and love that we just had Ayurveda and Valium. Yeah, and, and I know, I know. That's right. Hey, I always say that if you, it's, it's Western and Eastern have to work together. That's exactly right. And I think most, um, I think most Ayurvedic practitioners would agree with that because yeah. that's kind of their outlook, right? Um, so I sort of work on it throughout the day and really my entire day is spent preparing for bed you know um and that's just what i gotta do sure. um, i drink coffee but i make sure i you know sort of have it before 10 o'clock in the morning i have mm-hmm. one cup i love the stuff and i'm just careful with other things i love red wine but i have one glass you sure. know and it's better off i'm better off allowing it rather than denying it but one glass is is enough to make me a bit sleepy but not keep me awake mm-hmm. or wake me up I just have to do a whole bunch of little things that are maintenance and create boundaries. I can't be out after 9.30 at night because I need an hour when I get home to just tone everything down, calm down, the whole thing. People don't understand it. They really don't. They kind of think that I'm being melodramatic, but without sleep, I'm cactus, you know. Um, (laughs) 
Look, I, I do explore a number of theories. One of them that I really like, and I think it's Alain de Botton, the uh, English philosopher. He runs a great setup called the School of Life, which is a philosophy school, and it runs in Australia as well. He's written a bunch of books on anxiety, all kinds of things. His books are amazing. He's a super, super smart guy. He explores the idea that insomnia is kind of like it happens to those of us who have got a lot of thoughts in our head, and sometimes it's the quietness at night that's the only time where we can really mm. hear our own thoughts and so that find, I find comfort in that I sometimes realize that it's necessary I've got stuff to process and so at night is probably the only time I can do it sure I don't have a straightforward answer um, but I do explore a number of different wonderful theories that make me feel better about the fact that I don't sleep that's I and that's it. a good enough solution for me for now I love it so it seems like anxiety is way more common Mm. Do you feel that's because it's been underdiagnosed or do you think things like technology, social media or that's are adding fuel up. to the fire? What do you yes and no, which sounds like a disappointing answer. However, I'll break it down. I think there's two types of anxiety. And what I find really interesting is that some of the disorders such as OCD and bipolar have existed in the same percentage in populations around the world at different times in history, at any time in history. It's about 1.2 to 1.5% of the population, whether it's here in Manhattan or in the Kalahari Desert or in the Amazon, right? 1.2-ish percent of the population have these two particular disorders and a bunch of others as well. That has not changed. And mm. that's what I find really, really interesting. And what that made me think, and it's made other evolutionary biology biologists think the same thing, is that there's a, this evolutionary quirk exists for a reason, right? And there was a great study done, an obscure study, and it took me forever to find the citation for it. I heard it re uh, referenced a few times and I had to dig around through the Googles, you know, to find to find it eventually. And that's the great thing about being bipolar. <laughs> if you need to find something, you know, you will go you won't stop. It's a dog with a bone. <laughs> so I eventually found this study and it's uh, Diane Fossey was her name and she sure. did this study with chimps, I think about 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. And she noticed that there were some chimps that displayed O C D and bipolar type highly anxious kind of tendencies and they were ostracized they sat on the outside of the clan they were particularly nervous hypersensitive they were bullied but what happened is they were the ones that could hear danger in the middle of the night they stayed awake all night and they could hear things she took this particular these these chimps away from the clan or the group they survived six months and then it disbanded um, the whole group the power of the group disbanded and um, that, I think, is really, really interesting, wow. that it suggests to me, and it has obviously to many others, that, um, you know, th these anxious quirks have existed in our being because we've needed um, hypersensitive people. I mean, I often say it was probably a bipolar person that went over the hill and, went, you know, was brave enough to venture away from the pack and went, oh, my God, guys, there's these people over the hill who've invented this thing called the wheel. We <laughs> really should get onto it, you know. And if you look around today, some of the best creatives, I mean, politicians, um, thinkers, inventors, entrepreneurs have incredibly debilitating at times anxiety. Mm. So that type of anxiety, I believe, is an evolutionary quirk that exists for a reason, a very beautiful reason. It keeps us safe. It keeps us progressing forward as um, as a race, or as you know, right. as humanity. But then there's another type of anxiety, and I call it everyday or fair enough anxiety. It's the anxiety where there's in, there's a trigger. I can tell you now that my bipolar and my OCD, it doesn't really have a trigger most of the time. It's just in my bones. Like if somebody says, "What caused this?" I'm like, mm, I don't know. It was just, it just came on, right? But then there's anxiety where there's a fair enough trigger. You've got a presentation that you've got to give tomorrow sure. or or whatever it might be you know and I think that is on the increase and I think a big part of why it's on the increase I don't think it's necessarily about we now report it more often and there's more of a discussion about it so people are realizing oh hey I'm anxious as well I think it's more to do with the fact that we live in a culture which emulates the, the anxious experience so we fret we run around madly you say to somebody how are you so oh, I'm so busy 
right? Mm-hmm. That's our default position. Right. It's almost like it's a badge of honor. We, we, we ride on the currency of, of freshiness, you know. Um, we toggle between things. We move at a speed that's not conducive to, to discerning thought. Um, we no longer have a day of rest. You know, when I grew up, Sunday was a day of rest. In other cultures, it's a sad well, day, whatever no it phones. is. You weren't walking around with a phone. Neither we was had I. no was phone. No social media. There and was none of that. You worked nine to five, and if you worked beyond that, you had an HR department that you were going to complain to, and you got overtime, right? And or time in lieu. That just doesn't happen anymore. And so, we are we are kind of living anxiously. We may not even be anxious, you know, like we don't have saber-toothed tigers chasing after us anymore, but we are just creating an anxious experience in our brains. And so it's kind of, I think that's why it's speeding up, especially amongst right. teenagers. Well, given all that you just said, are you optimistic about the world we live in or pessimistic? I am an optimist. That It comes from tenacity. Like I just will not give up. Um, which is a an Achilles heel uh, at times, but I get very concerned, and the things that concern me are very much about the, the, what we prioritize and what we value at the moment. Consumer society distresses me no end i 'm very anti consumption and I just look at the way that we're living. It's just we're burning through resources. We're burning through our sense of self. Uh, we just have this outward clutching kind of behavior. We're constantly reaching away and out for something more, something more, something more. And it's distressing to, to, to watch. So let me ask you, you're, you're, you know, you've got a following, you're a powerful personal brand and one of those platforms where you've Instagram. So yeah. like, how do you deal with Instagram in a way that you view as healthy and yeah. manageable? Yeah, it's a really good question because I question all the time. I wouldn't be on social media if I didn't feel this need to communicate what I think is important stuff, right? So, yeah, I use it to promote my books, but I believe in my books, you know, and and what I put into my books. So I, um, you know, I use it as a way to show different ways of living. So, you know, I I show myself, I mean, I wear the same outfits over and over again. And I think that's important for young women to see. You know, Mm -hmm. people know I live out of one bag, you know, the bag that I'm carrying over there. (laughs) I travelled for five months. You know, it's a day pack with that, you know, and I've got it for this trip as well. I I, I sort of try to use it as a as a bit of a propaganda machine, to be honest, sure. against capitalism. And capitalism, I mean, I sound like a 101 university student. I What I mean by that is consumption, right. um, excessive and a needless ex- consumption. So, yeah, it's – I find Instagram a kind medium. It can be very powerful because you can paint a picture very mm-hmm. quickly, but I do – treat it responsibly so what does success look like to you for someone who had a very successful monetary you know business and Mm -hmm. and you decided to walk away from it and what does success look like um look i would say it's it's having freedom um success success is getting older and growing into myself and feeling comfortable to say the stuff that i truly believe i didn't feel that way for most of my career I had this burning desire to to rage, you know, rage against the machine. I can now do that and, you know, I've written a book that says I'm mad. So (laughs) it's given me license to do that, you know. So success for me is being able to have the voice that I need to voice. And, yeah, I, I feel that this book has enabled that mostly because of the conversation like this one that we're having, it's. Um, I wrote the book because I wanted to have a more interesting conversation, and it certainly sure. en- enabled that. So that's yeah, that's success. So what keeps you up at night, and what has <laughs> you excited things. in the morning? <laughs> Most things. That's a fair answer. What has you excited in the morning then? Uh, I get out of bed, and it doesn't matter if I've had no sleep. I'm I'm on. Um, what gets me out of bed? Uh, nature. It's. I live. Uh, the only way I could move back to Australia and live in one spot was if I was near the ocean. I have to see her in a horizon. So I live around about oh, 
I can't remember what it would be in yards. What's 100 metres in yards? Not far. Not far. <laughs> yeah, I like that. really close. I can see the the, um, the ocean. I, I live right on Bondi Beach and I get in there most days and I ocean swim. I swim and I can see stingrays and schools of fish and, you know, dolphins and that gets me out of bed is just being in water or on rocks and dirt. Mm. It just grounds me. And when I'm not good, um, I will get up, I will sacrifice everything, I will cancel everything, and I'll go hiking with, again, that same bag. Um, <laughs> if it's a tent and a stove, um, and I'll go and camp. I'll just go and find a bit of dirt. I'll camp. I'll sleep overnight. I've walked, you know, at, at the pace of discerning thought. I've, I've pounded out my thoughts. I go home, and I'm kind of fixed, you know. So um, that will get me out of bed. And if last question, if you could go back in time and give your twenty-something self advice, what advice would that be? Uh, it would it would be please believe me. This will all make sense. This will all mean something. It will all lead to something. That's 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 all I needed to know back then. I love it much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. First, we make the beast beautiful. A new journey through anxiety. Sarah Wilson, pick up the book, life-changing book. <laughs> if you suffer from anxiety or know someone who suffers from anxiety, I guarantee you do. It's a great book. Pick it up. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.